being here. Um, quick show of hands. How many people parents of ninth graders? Ah, perfect. <laughs> so this works out great. Um, show of hands, how many people parents of ninth graders and also already uh, have students that have either come through the high school or um, are currently still in the high school as upperclassmen? Okay, so it's a mix. Um, so for ninth grade parents, if we didn't get a chance to meet yet, I'm Dave Cohen, I'm the principal, um, and Matt Samuelson, the assistant principal, and this is a really important night for you to be at. Um, so I'm going to uh, walk you through um, a pretty detailed presentation. And uh, there's going to be a lot of information. Your head may swim a little bit at times. I want to be able to give you the story and the background around the things that we're thinking about in addition to some of the technicalities. So I know there'll be a temptation to just grab this packet, maybe go and look through it. But I don't think it'll really make as much sense to you without us having a chance to have this conversation. And I really mean that. It's going to be a conversation. So tonight is not about Matt and, 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 and I standing here and just saying, so this is what got us to this point. This is hence the right answer. And now we're just going forward. So this isn't just about information. Um, this is about an opportunity for us to gather information. So I know we held a parent information night last year, uh, which was really important. It gave us a lot of insights. Uh, Matt is not just going to be checking his email throughout the night, but he's actually going to be helping and taking notes and uh, making sure that um, some of the good questions and some of the good input that you provide us with tonight is stuff that we capture and bring back to our scheduling committee. So this is a rough agenda that we have for the night. Obviously, right now, we're in the middle of number one, welcome in an overview. Um, we're going to walk you through um, a little bit of a storyline of the journey that we've been on. and. Uh, why even consider um, a change in the school's master schedule, uh, which kind of leads to a big question that we have, um, and we'll share it when we get to that slide. But it's essentially the essential, the essential question that drives us. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to identify some of our values and our needs. Um, and through that, I'll talk about how we even get to that. So whose values and needs are they? Are they the values and needs of the teachers? Are they the values and needs of the students? Are they the values and needs of the parents? And ultimately, it's, it's all of us. Um, but you know, I want to make sure that you're informed about uh, all of the input and all of the thinking. Um, and it's been a very, very detailed process just to get to the point that we're at. And then, after all of that, we're finally going to get into um, some real core details, which is a glossary of terms. Um, there's some lingo and language that uh, we need to sort of catch you up to speed with to make sure that the rest of the packet makes sense. Uh, we're going to talk about this thing called an IE period that uh, has been discussed um, a lot. And then ultimately, we're going to show you the four models uh, that uh, the scheduling committee has really deeply been exploring and trying to consider uh, which one would be um, right for Irvington High School. Um, so let me take you th a little bit through what has been our journey. Um, so uh, it's, it's really been a number of years. Actually, I would say it's actually been since the day I walked in here and with Dr. Corn in the back of the room, she knows I'm about to talk about her. Um, almost from the start and given uh, my high school experience, she wanted to know right away, have you had experience in implementing um, alternative master schedules? And while I didn't have um, direct experience in implementing um, a different master schedule, the very first school that I worked in um, for 13 years to start my career had a schedule where classes met three times a week for an hour each day. And there was a different schedule every day of the week. And there were pros and cons to that. Um, so as I've had a chance to really get to know Irvington and get to know our school, Dr. Cora and I have advanced that conversation and more and more started to realize there could be something really important for us. And as I got a chance to see all the things that really highlighted our strengths, I also recognized some things that were really holding us back. And um, it really was about a year and a half ago two years ago that we started to then have these conversations with the faculty at the high school. And um, really started to go through the lens of what is the culture that we're looking to, to foster and promote. Culture with our students, culture as a, pro a learning community, a professional learning community. Um, and through that we started to realize that there were aspects of our master schedule that really hold us back. 
Um, and that led us to some really um, uh, concrete work. So it says there that we managed to bring on board um, someone who's really an internationally renowned guru of, of scheduling, of all levels, but especially of high school. And I mean that, he does, he works all over the world. And his name is Mike Reddick. Um, and uh, I was fortunate to be able to bring a team of, I think it was uh, eight um, faculty members uh, at uh, the end of the 15-16 school year to a meeting that Mike Reddick hosted um, with all schools from uh, Southern Westchester BOCES. And through that, um, we learned so much. He kind of walked us through the history of how master schedules, especially traditional master schedules, have been developed around the country. Um, and through that, we learned so much. We learned in some areas of the country, students often only take five or six periods a day. I think six was, was, was the smallest, including lunch. Um, and then certain areas of the country where uh, students may be taking a lot more. And, you know, it kind of put us sort of knowing where we fell along that continuum of how many classes our students take and, and, and uh, not necessarily length of day, but how many classes they have to prepare for and what that means. Um, and then he started to show the group that day all um, alternative models, different ways of looking at how you can schedule your day and accomplish what you want. And our eyes started to open up so much and our excitement started to open up so much. So it really got us thinking and we were able to then bring Mike into our school last year to work exclusively with us. And we formed a scheduling committee of um, 19 faculty members um, at the high school, but it goes beyond just the high school because we're a shared campus. So we wanted uh, faculty members that are in multiple buildings, so we would have that perspective. We wanted uh, teachers that were teaching in each and every department uh, that we represent. We wanted to make sure that there were guidance counselors representative, administrators representative. We had uh, Mr. Sotile come and sit on uh, a number of those days. So uh, we wanted to make sure that our perspective was um, as broad as we could and um, uh, started to really look through what we wanted. And one of the first things that Mike asked us to do was to identify areas in our master schedule that we really liked. And the number one thing that we came to was um, that our current master schedule provides a lot of choice, a lot of choice for students. And uh, we started to recognize just how important that is. Um, and regardless then of any changes that we wanted to consider, we needed to make sure that student choice um, was um, still remained at the forefront of uh, whatever iterations we may come up with. Um, and you know, some other things that we noticed that we really like is that student choice isn't just about what classes they might be able to select, but student choice can also be about extracurricular experiences. So one of the things that struck me when I first became principal in Irvington was that it was a school that was committed to having club experience two times a month. And we actually, on those days, take time away from every period to open up a half hour period at the end of the day. Um, I'll add that I don't know if that's the ideal way to do it, and I think that's part of what this process has shown, but it's a commitment to our students and their learning beyond just what their experiences in a classroom would provide. Um, and then that kind of shifted us over to things that maybe our master schedule isn't great at. What, what might be things that we would need? So, um, for instance, I'll just share uh, the same thing. Uh, while we have club experience, um, often students have to pick and choose between different clubs that they want to attend. In addition to that, um, we're taking away from class time two Tuesdays a month in order to do that. It's not really built into the schedule, and it's also at the end of the day. So quite frankly, some of our students don't take advantage of it. And it's, um, I don't know if I want to say that I want to mandate it per se, but it's not necessarily um, put into our schedule in an ideal way to maximize um, students taking advantage of it and really having um, enough time to enrich their experience. In addition to that, um, we started to realize not every student in Irvington High School takes lunch. 
um, that uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Sometimes it's choice, and sometimes it's because of um, the way the schedule falls. But either way, we've started to really look at that and question, is that really what we're looking for? Is that the best thing for, for, for our kids? And we'll talk more about that. Um, but ultimately, we want our students to be successful in their classes. And one of the ways that that's uh, really important is to make sure that they have access to their teachers. And one, another thing that we noticed in our schedule is um, sometimes they don't have the access to their teachers that we're really looking for. And um, we're constantly trying to help elevate our teachers' experiences and do professional development. So often, uh, not often, but sometimes that means we're pulling teachers out of classes um, for a couple of periods here and there to have those experiences. And quite frankly, we also have a program in our school where sometimes we're pulling our kids out of classes. So for instance, our peer leadership program. Great program. We take peer leaders, 33 of them who are seniors. They work with our freshmen. They develop really strong bonds. But they meet once a week. And the way that they meet is they come out of one of the freshmen, come out of one of their classes to do that. So we started to say, you know, maybe there's ways that we can look at our master schedule and make one that works right for us. So we're not pulling kids out of classes. We're not pulling teachers out of classes. So we started to think about two really important things. One is, how do we make sure that we're keeping classroom time sacred? Um, and I know that that was something I heard from the faculty, especially, over and over again. And the other thing that we started to talk about is, does our schedule really foster the mentor-mentee relationship that we really want to happen between teachers and faculty members and students? Um, and as we continue, I'm going to start to suggest why I think our current master schedule isn't the best solution to do that. So I mentioned to you before that um, we want to think of an essential question, um, or we did think of an essential question to drive our work. And the question is, what is the relationship between a master schedule and a school's culture? Um, you know, some people may think of a master schedule as this. So some of you may know what this picture is. Um, anyone who's been in my office knows that there's a scheduling board that sits on one side. Um, and this is all of our classes. It's by department, the green is the English, um, et cetera, et cetera, and it has all of our periods. So I can instantly look at this and know all of our classes, where they sit, and how it falls. Um, but this isn't really what a master schedule is. Uh, this is just where things fall on a map. This, I think, is really what a master schedule is about, and that's about the culture of your school. That the way that you lay out your day, the way that you ask students to go through their learning experiences, the enrichments that you can provide for them, the way that you can make sure that they have access to teachers and club experiences, and also feel manageable around their schedule, um, is what really starts to talk about what student life is it talks about the ability for students to be able to network and their learning experiences and their ability to participate in things, to feel like they have, uh, uh, you know, the representative of, of being involved in school and recreation. Um, so it really became the question that drove us as a scheduling team, that we weren't just looking at a better way to move the furniture around and a better way to structure things. We really, really wanted to make sure that we were maximizing students' experience, their learning experience, student life that we have here at Irvington High School um, and to make sure that we're doing the very best for each and every one of our kids through that process. Um, so as we started, we, we met with um, one of the steps, let me back up a little bit, one of the steps was to get information from students last year. So we created um, a day where we had um, students that had been recommended by teachers. We made sure that we had students that were recommended at every grade level. We made sure that we had students that were recommended for being in every niche of our building and our, and our school culture that you can imagine, whether it was academic performance level, sports oriented, music oriented, arts oriented, uh, someone who was uh, highly sociable, someone who was shy. We had a, an amazing representation of students in the room. In fact, so much that we had to do two sessions of it in one day. And I think we had upwards of 50 to 60 students from last year's uh, student body that participated. And we provided a very similar presentation to what we're, uh, we're providing to you tonight. Um, and then we had an opportunity to get some input. So as we were creating this very similar presentation last year, um, I asked Matt to get me um, a diagram 
that show, but not a diagram, a picture on the internet of something that my friend had said to me a long time ago. Um, and Matt says, that picture doesn't exist. And you're gonna, you see the picture now, and it'll make sense when I explain. So I have a good buddy of mine who's actually a social studies teacher in Edgemont, and I remember when we first became high school teachers together, um, you know, we wanted to change the world, and he would often tell me what he felt like a high school student's experience was on a daily basis, and the experience goes like this. A student walks into their first period uh, class, it's usually very early in the morning, and the teacher expects them to pop their head open as they start to pour information into their head. At some point in time, the bell rings, we ask the kid to put their head closed, and they have them within three minutes shuffle away to the next class, at which point in time they sit down and ask to pop their head open, and the next teacher starts to pour information Rings, they pop their head close, and, and, and we keep doing this until the bell rings at the end of the day, and then we want to send them home to the tunnel. And it's an exhaustive experience. And, um, you know, when I gave that analogy to students, they were all going like this. Like, that is their world. It resonates for them. And we have students that learn in all different ways. And by the way, having the information poured for some students may work well, but for others, we, we know that it really may not be the best thing. So number one, like length of how long a period is, starts to dictate some of what that teaching and learning experience is going to be. But it also speaks to just the way we sort of shuffle our students through their day at the high school level. So again, I asked Matt, why don't you picture that? And sure enough, you found it. So that's what um, the day looks like for kids. Um, so that sort of starts to embody one of the reasons why we want to consider change. Um, you know, I said it before, academic success is paramount to what we want to provide. We want to make sure that we're maximizing our students' ability to be successful. So ultimately, that's another reason to consider change. And there's a lot of great things that are already happening here in Irvington. But if there could be opportunities for us to be able to create a classroom structure, either a length of period, um, or an opportunity to even do more professional development with our teachers where it's not coming out of their classroom, they're not pulling them away from their kids, then um, we have an opportunity to really start even further elevating instruction and teaching and learning. In addition to that, we want to make sure that we're maximizing our students' ability to have enrichment opportunities, to be able to um, experience more club opportunities. You know, one of the things that strikes me each and every day here in Irvington is um, some of the best ideas come from our kids. You know, a couple of years ago, it became a major initiative, um, and Dr. Harrison and I work a lot on it, was to make sure that we created more student voice in the high school. And the more student voice that we create, the better things become here in the high school. So to create spaces for that, and to make sure that students can take advantage of their great ideas and their potential club and extracurricular experiences is really important. And right now, our current schedule um, and then I'm going to come back to the lunch piece. And this is a piece that I don't want to harp on too much, but it's another one that resonated very strongly for our students and kind of goes back to that picture and what I described before. Um, and that is the amazing amount of stress and pressure and tension that we see teenagers going through in this day and age. It's probably always existed, um, but in my 23 um, years as an educator, I've only seen it get worse and uh, the amount of stress and pressure that our teenagers go through is incredible. And I'm worried. I'm worried about them, and I'm worried that our master's schedule um, actually feeds into that rather than supports it and helps to uh, create a calmer learning environment. And I'm going to explain why. Um, uh, I mentioned that Mike Redding told us that he's worked all over the country around the world. So he'll work with districts that only offer six classes to their students. And by the way, they're great places around this country. Um, and when it comes time to the, their students being seniors and applying to college, um, they have students that, guess what? They're going to the finest uh, colleges and university that our country offers. Um, there are also schools that offer more. So we offer a 10-period um, a day if our students take uh, music. Um, and that Mike shared with us is the absolute highest that he has seen anywhere throughout the country. Um, he hasn't seen schools that offer more than um, 10 periods of instruction a day for students. Um, and to make matters even more extreme, um, 
he very rarely sees any that not only offers 10, but where uh, students can bypass lunch and take full 10 periods of class a day. So think of what I described before and all the pouring of information. And we ask many of our students to go through 10 periods of that with not a single break in their day, no lunch. And we haven't even talked about just the, the pure nutritional health values that lunch needs to provide for us. Um, and I am really fearful that we're providing an unhealthy learning environment for our students when we perpetuate that. Um, so the question is, what alternatives exist out there? Um, and how do we maximize? Because, you know, I started this presentation by talking about the thing we value so much is choice. I value the, the amount of classes that we offer to our students. I value the richness of our programs. I mean, we have a classics program um, that is second to none around this country. Um, so the last thing that I want to do is create a structure whereby students can't maximize their learning experiences. But at the same time, um, I fear the structure we've created. Because I mentioned before that students in those districts that only offer six classes are still going to top colleges, Ivies. They're going to top select colleges. Sometimes we have this misnomer that our students are competing against students in other high schools around the country and around Westchester when they're applying to college. And there's a certain level to that that, that certainly has s some truth, but they're not going to be compared based on how many courses they're taking. Where they're going to be compared is within their own school. So as soon as we create a standard whereby a student can take 10 periods a day, and we put it on our school profile that these are all the courses that we take and a student can take 10 periods, we've now set the standard bearer as to what our students need to compete for and with in Irvington. Because if I have two students here and one is taking eight periods a day and doing really well and one is taking 10 periods a day and doing really well, that becomes the competition for colleges. And there's a level of this that I understand. There are some students that have a thirst and they want to learn and they want to learn more. So, you know, we want, there's a need to balance that. But there's also, I've been here long enough, an expectation to keep pace that our students collectively have that I can tell you for most is unhealthy. And it's a problem and it's a struggle. And I think it's one that we can address. Um, so when I talk to you and it says here, what do we value? I'm speaking very passionately and from my heart as principal as to what I value for our kids. Um, and I want them to be as successful as they possibly can be. I want their enrichment experiences to be as broad as it can be. I want them to be able to explore specialty areas and, and thirst for learning as broadly as they can. But paramount, I want them to be healthy. Because if they're not healthy, then all of this learning comes crumbling down for them potentially at some point in time. And I do. I work with families and kids that are in crisis um, almost daily. Um, and it's dangerous. So I think it's important that we understand that. And I think you're going to hear some real examples of things um, that will show alternatives and ways that we can get around this. So I told you that we met with students. And when we met with students, um, we got some really strong impressions from them. So when they started to talk about things that's, that they thought were really great about our current master schedule, um, students have a lot of choices. So they said the same thing that we already anticipated. They know they have a lot of choices. And they love that they have so many course options. Um, and it's not just in these, this formal setting that we heard this from students. Matt and I um, host our core value award ceremonies every month. And every time we do that, it's another opportunity to hear from our students. What do you value? What works really well here? And the amount of times that I hear all the different types of courses, especially as a junior and senior, that I can take at Irvington High School is amazing. So that's good. We want to keep that. Um, the length of classes is not too long. Uh, we heard from a number of students. Um, the ability to have three periods is something that we heard from students. Club schedules and assemblies expose kids to new things. They like those things. Uh, what are things that students feel our current master schedule lacks? Packed schedule can take away from necessary break time. Um, and these are actual quotes that we got from kids. Um, the ability to take more electives without stressing about it being too much. Every class meets every day, which leads to too much homework. When we started to hear from students, all of a sudden I started to think through the lens of a student. So, you know, I said it before, but it's not just the pouring of information through 10 periods a day or nine periods a day. It's then that, that student needs to go home and be responsible for keeping pace 
with nine to 10 classes that are in their schedule. And if they have multiple tests coming up and multiple papers due and multiple homework that teachers are gonna check, that becomes a lot. Um, hence the next bullet, very stressful schedule and there isn't enough time for clubs. So the same way they said they value that we have clubs, they also say we don't have enough time for clubs. So we are competing. We're competing against one another because we're taking 10 classes. We're competing for effective time for all the things that students want to do as, as, as growing teenagers to expand their learning and their experiences in school. Um, and ultimately, a master schedule is not just about how classes fall in a grid. It's about the student life and the culture that we want to create. So now is where we start to get technical. And um, I want to be able to take you through some terms that are going to be important for you to understand. Um, number one is uh, block schedule. Some of you may have heard about block schedule. Um, and a block schedule is a format that creates longer lesson periods, um, sometimes as much as twice the length of a standard period. So uh, block schedule can often mean that uh, classes would be roughly 80 minutes per period. Um, in a block schedule, uh, it typically creates the advantage of allowing teachers to create more in-depth learning opportunities. So one of the concerns that students will always say, if you're going to put me through 80 minutes of lecture, I don't want block schedule. And they're right. No one wants 80 minutes of, of lecture on a regular basis. But it certainly creates the opportunity for much different types of learning experiences in a classroom. And uh, typically, uh, block schedule uh, would then create uh, the need for classes to meet every other day. So uh, if I have English period one, rather than go to period one every single day, I would have English every other day, and it would be roughly double the length of, of the block first periods, which are 42 minutes. Okay. Um, the next is drop schedule, which we also refer to as a rotation. You're going to see visuals of this in a little while, so if it doesn't fully make sense, the visuals will help. A drop schedule rotates the classes through the cycle so that a class that meets the first period slot today would actually meet in the second slot of the day tomorrow, and then the third slot the day after that. In order to accommodate all the numbers of classes that you offer, some number of classes would drop out of the schedule each and every day. And I'm going to give you an example that shows that. Um, so it'll make more sense. Um, and like it says here, but I'll take you through it. When I show you the chart, this one can be confused. Um, so again, not every period meets every day, but the period lengths are not as long as block. They're uh, longer than our current 42 minutes. Um, and some of the classes would rotate out each of the day. The next is uh, something that we're going to talk a little bit more about in a little while, which is the IE period. IE stands for I, intervention, E, enrichment. So intervention, more time with, uh, with teachers or wherever our helps may be around the school, and E, enrichment, clubs, uh, student ideas, assemblies, ways to broaden learning beyond the classroom. Um, it could be a period in the day that's dedicated to either of these, either academic remediations, academic supports, um, tutoring, AIS. Um, it's not just for struggling learners. Plenty of our most successful learners need more time with their teachers. Um, and the other part of it is these enrichment, this enrichment time. Um, so you're going to hear a little bit more about it in a few minutes where uh, a potential IE period uh, strategically placed in our day can take care of a lot of the things that are creating the limitations in our current master's schedule. The next really goes back to a health factor that I talked before, um, and that uh, one term would be mandatory lunch. So all students have to take lunch, it's mandatory. Um, another way of creating mandatory lunch is to do something called a unit lunch. A unit lunch is where the entire school has lunch at the same time. There are no courses, no classes offered at that time. It's not an option for students to take a class in the middle of their lunch because it is a unit lunch. Faculty, kids, everybody, lunch at the same time. Um, so as we started to explore and realized we need our students to take lunch because it's unhealthy for students to bypass and not have lunch in their day, no 
nobody should go an entire day without having a break to have lunch. And if students want to use that to explore their thinking, then that's great. Right. That's a personal choice while they're eating their lunch. But to go into a classroom and bypass a lunch is not a healthy environment. Um, so let me slow down. I feel like I've given you a ton of information. So we're gonna, uh, I'm about to show you some models and really get technical. But from a theoretical standpoint, from this glossary of terminology, are there any questions that have come up? Any, anything you want me to reiterate? I must be doing a pretty good job tonight. There were a lot of questions the first time I did this. Okay, good. So now let's get technical. So this is a layout, and this is a sample. I'm going to say it 15 times. This is a small smattering of a very truncated sample of what IE could look like. This is not a comprehensive model. It, if we did this, there would be far more choices because this only speaks to a small handful of teachers and a small handful of the clubs that we offer. So, before I get into what, what this is all about, let me remind you. We offer clubs twice a month for 28 minutes. So if we have students that want to participate in clubs, in multiple clubs, they have 28 minutes twice a month to scramble into that. Number two, we offer um, 30 minutes at the end of our day from 2.35 to 3.05, where ideally teachers are available to meet with students who need help. But that's also during our ninth period music program, and we have one Latin class that we offer at that time. So if students take music classes um, or that Latin class, they're not available when the teacher potentially is available to meet for extra help. In addition to that, that's also a time where we schedule team meetings if a parent needs to come up and meet with a group of teachers. So sometimes we're scheduling meetings for teachers to be at, so they're not even available during that very truncated 30 minute window to help students. So we're competing for that time. In addition, um, assemblies, every time we want to run a school-based assembly, um, we truncate our schedule down, we shorten our class periods, and we build in roughly 50 minutes in the middle of the school day in order to do that. Um, we do what is called uh, double period meetings um, once a month with every department because we value professional learning, professional development, the ability to explore student work and, and, and really grow as professionals. Every time I do that with each of the departments, some of those teachers are coming out of classes and I'm putting a substitute teacher in that room. So this gives us the ability to do all of those things without touching classroom time. So I'm gonna walk you through and explain what this means. So I'm giving you a four-day rotation right now. It'll make sense in a little while why I'm doing it over a four-day rotation, but we cannot think, we're, we're changing our thinking from this point forward in the presentation. No longer are we thinking of uh, school weeks as Monday through Friday. We're thinking of our, our, our structure based on whatever number of days define our cycle. So right now I'm gonna take you through four days. So in some week, Day one might be Monday, and day four may be Thursday, and another week it may be different. So we're not thinking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're thinking day one, day two, day three, day four. And on day one, whenever this IE period would exist, we have the ability to offer a series of different options for students. One option could be that their math teacher, in this case it's Ms. DiNapoli, is offering office hours. So if they want to go see Ms. DiNapoli because they need help in math that day, they can go see Ms. DiNapoli. Otherwise, we could potentially offer a series of club experiences that students could participate in. So these are just some examples on this four-day model. So on day one, I could have Model UN, Academic Challenge, Positive Impact Club, all working. Students could go to the library. Notice that the library is available on each and every one of those days. And we also started last year, we developed um, our National Honor Society, and one of the mandates for every student who is in National Honor Society is that they have to give back to our school community by performing peer tutoring and making themselves available. It's a growing program, um, and it's one that we still um, need to do some work around, but I believe if the space was available, and clearly not as an add-on at the end of the day, but during the school day when all students are here, we'd see more students taking advantage of that. 
Similarly on day two, and I purposely picked these teachers because they teach, um, it, it, these teachers are, for some, is a very traditional 10th grade program at our school. So again, this is just one very small example. Day two, Mr. Whitehead uh, has office hours for his chemistry class. Then there's peer leadership. So all those ninth graders that right now are missing one of their classes every week to rotate through in order to meet with their peer leaders and do great work can now do it during this time. Uh, CBF planning, we have uh, character building facilitators, 11th and 12th graders that work with Mr. Samuelson and push down to the middle school rather than pulling out of classes to do their planning. They do it at this time. Um, the IHS Singing Instrumental Society is one of our clubs. Again, library peer tutoring. Day three, we have Mr. Fada, office hours, student council meets, there's the archery club, key club, library. Um, day four, Mr. Bolito has office hours, our QSA club meets, the environmental club meets, the Latin club meets, and we have these other experiences. What I haven't showed you, this is through the lens of what a student would look at and their choices. What I haven't even built in here is that in this, I don't know if it would be a four day cycle, it may be over two of these, I would have each department meet with Mr. Samuelson and myself um, so that work that we've been pulling them out of classes for can go into this time and we can do some professional learning and some of the things uh, that we want to accomplish in that setting. Again, never taking them out of their standard and traditional classes. So again, this is a small truncated version of what IE can provide, but I want to give you that lens through a student perspective as to what it could mean for our school. So are there any questions about what an IE period can provide? Wow. I really am doing a good job. Or at least I'm self-promoting that. OK, so now is when we start to merge these concepts together. So I'm going to show you four models, four models. The first model, and it's really two models, and each has a variation. So the first model here is drop with a unit lunch. The first thing I'm going to point out to you is notice that from 1114 to 1156, every day, the entire high school has lunch. Everybody. And you may ask the question, how is that going to happen? We can't fit everyone in the cafeteria. So one of the things that I didn't mention is that one of the things the scheduling committee did last year was we first we started and we identified through Mike Reddy um, about six to eight schools in mainly in New York, New Jersey, and uh, Pennsylvania that um, with Mike have implemented master schedule change. And we interviewed, first we started with administration, and we interviewed them around certain aspects. So we spoke to a number of schools that do an intervention enrichment period. We spoke to a number of schools that do unit lunch and shifted. And by the way, schools quadruple our size. 2,000 students that have gone to unit lunch. Um, and uh, schools on block schedule and schools on drop schedules. To interview, find out the pros, the cons, what made for six successful transitions Again, what would they do differently? And then we went and we visited the four of them. So we went to two schools in Pennsylvania, and we went to two schools um, just over the bridge in, um, in Rockland County. Um, and we saw schools with intervention enrichment, we saw schools with block scheduling, we saw schools with, uh, with drops, and we saw um, two or three schools that have um, unit lunch. Um, unit lunch can happen because your cafeteria is not the only place where lunch takes place. Your entire building and campus becomes a place for students to move their lunch. In some schools, we saw students finding space on the floor. I'm not saying that students have to eat on the floor, but you know what? Kids were really comfortable camping out on the floor and having their lunch. Sometimes it was because they bought lunch, sometimes it was because they brought lunch. Um, cafeterias often had satellites throughout campus where um, students were able to purchase lunch. So we could work with Aramark and potentially have a place somewhere else, maybe in the atrium, where they could just buy uh, sandwiches instead of going and, and being able to purchase hot food. So you provide a lot of options. A number of our students order from off campus. By the way, this would prevent us from having places off campus coming through all day long. Now it would be centralized to a single period if that happens when it would happen. 
happen. And there is no doubt there would be some learning. And some of the kids, quite frankly, ate the teacher's room. So I can't mandate a teacher to give up their classroom during their lunch. But what you naturally start to create is a culture where it's just going to happen. Some of our teachers are going to want to be with the kids. Some of our teachers are going to want to provide extra support time. It won't be mandated. I can't ask for it. But it's going to happen. Because that's what happens in schools when you create that, that, that space together. Students will spend more time with their teachers and their counselors in this type of environment. So the next is this rotation. So the times of each of the periods is along the way. One of the things that we had to go in knowing was that, um, and one of the things that we value and we all recognize is our music program. And if we start putting our music classes into our school day, we will create another layer of competition that will be very difficult. So we have, um, we have, I think, over half of our students at the high school participating in our music program. And if we start to put it into the regular schedule, our fear was, that we would lose out on that, that students would drop out of that. They would start to take other classes and blew up, and they would start to uh, create a competition. So everything that we're talking about will still have music classes for 42 minutes from 2.38 to 3.20. There's also some of our transportation uh, uh, nuances and challenges because of buses in district will first serve one school and then be redeployed to another school. So. Um, the window of time that we have for our buses, um, while potentially we could really look at it, um, was something that we tried to keep fixed and tried to adhere to. Um, so music is unchanged. So what we then did was we proposed looking at the times uh, from 7.50, same start time, to 2.35, which is the same time right now that our period in class ends. And this right now shows six periods per day but eight periods overall. So what I will tell you is that in order to create the intervention enrichment period, and in order to create the IE period, we had to take time from somewhere. And what we decided was instead of a 10 period day, where all of our kids are competing with each other, we're gonna offer a nine period day. Nine being music, and eight other classes of instruction that students can take. So none of that is lunch. And we also did a little bit of math, because I think there was an expectation that we had hundreds of kids that were taking 10 periods a day. And um, what we found out was that we had roughly um, 28 to 30 kids in the high school last year that were taking 10 full periods a day. Um, and um, very few of them were our classes. And that by being smarter about how we schedule some of our classes, uh, we have other kids that didn't have lunch because of ways that some of their half classes meshed, so they had free periods, but they didn't technically have lunch in their schedule. But if we married them in a better way, they would still have time for a lunch period. So 50-minute periods in this model instead of 42. And now I'm going to take you through what a drop schedule really looks like. So notice, in the morning, we're going to have class, uh, periods 1, 2, 3, and 4 that could meet. Then there's lunch. And then periods five, six, seven, four, eight could be. Notice that we also have intervention enrichment from 9.38 to 10.18. 40 minutes. Every day, kids have that enrichment period that I showed you and I talked about. So it's built into the schedule. So I said to you that periods one, two, three, and four could be in the morning, but we only have three slots. So on day one, and here now I'm calling it eight days, so I apologize for some of the confusion of not matching up. Period one to period two to the intervention enrichment. So that's like a break in the kid's day, right? Their brain gets to decompress for a little while. To period three, then we all have lunch and brains get to decompress again. And then we go to period five, six, and seven before we go to music. So notice that there's no period four and there's no period eight. It drops out on the first day of the second. Then what happens on day B is we start the day with period four, because now we're going to start rotating things. Here's the good news. That teacher, first of all, if your child comes to school late, they're not going to keep coming to the same teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we're going to spread that wall a little bit. Um, but it also means that, that 
no kid is going to have to say, I'm not good with math first period of the day. They're going to be able to experience it as it flows. So period four becomes the very first period of the day, followed by one, followed by two. Now period three drops out of the morning. Same thing happens in the afternoon. We'll start with eight, which didn't run yet. Then followed by five, six, period seven drops out. On the third day of the cycle, we start with three, then four, then one, period two drops out of the cycle. On the next day of the cycle, uh, in the afternoon, seven, eight, and five, six drops out. On the fourth day of the cycle, it's periods two, three, and four, one drops out, six, seven, and eight, five drops out. And every four days, every class meets three out of four days. So kids are getting 150 minutes of instruction every four days. In our current model, they're getting 160 minutes of instruction. But here's what they gain. They gain less transitions. So we say that our periods are 42 minutes. But every time that you change periods, it takes kids time to settle in their seat, to get acclimated, for a teacher to start a lesson. So now they're only starting three lessons out of every four days versus four lessons out of every four days. And teachers potentially have 50 minutes now to go deeper into the types of um, learning and, and instructional methodologies rather than 42 minutes every single day. I would also point out that the first period of the day is tough for late arrivals. But there are actually some periods in the day that are tough. The post lunch period can be difficult, and eight period can be difficult. In fact, I would make the argument that eight period can be the most difficult, and that class rotates through. So if you're done at the end of the day and you're looking at algebra and that's not your forte, that period eight can be a real nightmare for you, but it moves throughout the day. So that pressure of the last period that doesn't really fall into the course. Uh, Any questions? Yep. You're studying and then you have it the next day. You could very well have a period, a day off, and then have the test. You could. So this is going to follow a little bit more like a college schedule. And I think, you know, the ability for teachers and students to learn how to make sure that they're structured and organized is important. The good news is they don't have to go home right now and think of 10 periods in their day to do homework and study for. They can actually turn their brain off from two of them potentially tonight and focus on the others. Or they can at least turn off from the two that they're not going to take tomorrow and they're not going to be in those classes. And if they are having a test, then uh, maybe the teacher had aligned it to when they have office hours so that they're going to be able to go during intervention enrichment pro, uh, period for a little extra help before they're going to have that test maybe the following day. So there's definitely an adjustment. There's no denying that. Um, I know that some of the parent groups that we've heard from are uh, parents of students with IEPs and 504s and you know what any of these models look like. Um, there's not any one layer of concrete research out there that says one model is necessarily better than another. Um, but uh, if teachers are aware of the length of period time and how they're going to tell their instruction, um, then there could be real value from having less periods and uh, less periods in in a day and longer periods for any and all learners, um, but especially students um, with special needs. And I think that's a perfect way of putting it. I mean, listen, high school teachers always feel the stress of time because in the high school, that, that, that feeling of content and how much content a high school teacher has to get through is always going to be paramount in their thinking, especially if a class is ending in a regents exam where they feel, or an AP exam where they feel really responsible. Um, but sometimes, and I think this is part of the learning that we're going through as a faculty at the high school, um, you know, we really want to be in the business of teaching thinking. We want kids thinking. So if we're, 
and I'm not saying our teachers are doing this, but if we get in the bad habit sometimes of plowing through content, then what we're not doing is taking those opportunities to get kids to think more deeply. So sometimes there's a way to learn deeper and it can take a shorter amount of time. So often we think we're giving away time when actually we may be getting time back. Any other questions on this model? I guess one more question. Sure. Um, with the period nine being music yes. and then everything is a shorter amount, a shorter day, what about pulling the kids out? So you don't have to do that anymore? Like pulling the kids out for music class or peer leadership? Or so the music or class is still one that we're trying to figure out because I can't guarantee that music class the pullouts from music will take place during intervention enrichment. You know, there are still some things that we're trying to work through. We haven't finalized any one model, and even within them, there are some nuances. But the peer leadership pullout, um, uh, when we're pulling kids out of classes, because, uh, you know, Mr. Samuelson's working with a group for CBF, or I need to quickly have a meeting with stu student council, and I can't wait until the next um, uh, club period. I have all of those 40 minute intervention enrichment programs for all of that stuff to happen. So the great majority of reasons why we pull kids out of classes will not happen anymore. So here's the next model. It's exactly the same model except having the entire school have lunch at the same time. Half the school, half the teachers, half the kids have lunch at one time, and then half have it at another time. It's just, it's another way of looking at a very similar concept. There's pros and cons. We actually heard some of the students say to us that they will, you know, here as adults, we go in saying, unit lunch, it's going to be the greatest thing in the world. Kids are going to interact with each other, and they're going to have the greatest time. And then we start hearing from kids, and they're like, oh, that's going to create clicks. It's going to really showcase the clicks. I was like, how does that happen? We're all going to be together. No, but then you really see who's sitting with each other. So I think that's really, really important information. We really heard them. But I'm not so sure that that means you don't go with that model. The challenge that I then, the same way I said to you, I think student voice is important. I think student leadership in, in terms of recognizing a problem and overcoming it. So that's a really good problem to recognize. And then I think how the students structure lunch. So, you know, students may say during lunch that they're having certain types of, you know, maybe there's a book club or maybe there's an activity that goes on and, and anyone's welcome or uh, a certain group of seniors are inviting freshmen to come and have lunch with them today. So I think there are ways around that. That being said, there could be some advantages to having two of those unit lunches instead of one. So let me, let me talk you through how this happens. What we had previously, and I'll show you the previous slide again, was that um, lunch started at 11.14 and period, in this case, the period after lunch, period five on day one, started at 11.59. So lunch until the end of that period was 11.14 to 12.49. So if I think of that as a block of time, not just as two unique blocks, but I think of it as one block of time from 11.14 to 12.49, then I can either put lunch at the beginning of that time frame or lunch at the end of that time frame. So if half the school has lunch followed by this period and the other half has this period followed by lunch, then all I need to do is modify that segment and that's exactly what I did. So A are the, the A lunchers having period 5A, 8A, 7A, 6A based on our rotation and the B people have the period first followed by lunch. So they have 5B, 8B, 7B, 6B as their period in the rotation, and then they go to lunch. Everyone in the whole school goes back to the rotation for the remainder of the day, and leading up to 1114, everyone's following the same thing. So it's just a slight variation of the same model. I had trouble parsing that schedule at first, but if you look at the clock, Questions on that? What, what Matt said? So Matt, can you just speak up? If, if I found this challenging to understand when I first saw it. Um, but if you look at the left-hand column where the, the clock timing is, you can identify those two times or two because they're happening simultaneously, right? So, so it is 11.14 to 11.46 and then 11.59 to 
So that 49. Right. And this it repeats again from 11:14 to 12:49. So on A day, a student is either at 11:14 on A day, a student is either in lunch A or that student is in period 5B. Right. In the cafeteria, handle everybody for one lunch. No. So we don't expect. So here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, two things. Number one, not all of our kids go into the cafeteria right now anyway. And number two, in all the schools, and we visited a number that had unit lunch, the cafeteria was the least utilized place where kids ate lunch. <laughs> it's, it, it's actually, it's not where kids typically want to go during lunch. So um, it goes back to what I said before. You have to start to anticipate that your entire campus becomes a place for lunch. Um, now, we're a shared campus, so we're going to have to create some parameters so our kids can't just plow through the middle school spaces and use that for their lunch spaces, um, but they're, based on our visits to these schools, there is no reason to anticipate that our campus can't um, hold the ability to have a unit lunch or two lunches. Yes, <laughs> so it sounds like it's a real problem, but they only have to clean up one lunch period. So right now we have four lunch periods, so they have to clean up four different times. Now, the middle school is not looking to go to this schedule, so some of that may still exist a little bit. I think the middle school does three lunch periods. We do four. Um, but their resources will not have to go around. We actually were quite impressed in the schools that had unit lunch. As soon as the lunch period was over, custodians out in force sweeping the halls, and it was amazing how clean those buildings got like that. Uh -huh. At some point, stopped eating lunch because she only wanted to eat her belly. That's her own story. And that's when she had to eat lunch. So she stopped eating lunch yep. altogether for about eight months. Um, that's probably a concern for me. So that was a concern still, but you didn't know that that's already the situation. So you would take that to the rest of the school and you would make sure that there was a Correct. So we need to be talking with our mark. We need to be anticipating where our students are eating, um, when we're ready to start going to this. You know, we ideally are looking to finalize what our model will be sometime within the next four to six weeks, ideally, because what we need to do is use the rest of this year to build what an IE period would be if we're, if we're doing it to test these. What I want to do is I want to build in our computer system in a ghost account. I want to take all of our current kids that have schedules and I want to create these structures and then I want to put them into it and our teachers into it and I want to see the snafus that come up and I want to test it and we need to work with Aramark and we need to anticipate where they're going to have satellite stations and how we're going to serve lunch and how we're going to anticipate that. I want to I want to, we have to articulate this. We have to make sure everyone understands it, that whatever we put out there, people know what to do. If we have an IE period, how do kids maximize it? So there's so much work that we need to do, the food being a really important one of them. Problem? Nine periods. Yeah. So I could actually argue it the other way around um, because, well, I don't know if I can argue it totally the other way around. First thing I'm going to say is we're not anticipating having any less classes that we offer at Irvington High School than we currently have. And I, I know you're not saying that. I just say conflicts. Yeah. So the conflicts, there, there could be. So there's one advantage of starting all over again. There are um, master scheduling algorithms of how to run them and how to build a master schedule to try to. So I think that we could probably continue to be a little smarter. We always have conflicts, and we know that. And they're going to exist. And I'm not going to lie to people and say, we're going to make them go away. Um, but you know, there's one of the trade-offs and, and one of the things that we have to. So, I need to make sure that I'm being the very best that I can be at building a master schedule that minimizes conflicts because the gains that we have. So 
you know, the losses could be, it becomes tougher to make sure we're finding the right times for all of our periods so students don't have to bypass taking something during high school because it can't fit with something else. But I also want to make sure that we're gaining all of the positives about making sure our kids are healthy, they have lunch, they have decompression time, they have enrichment time, they have time with teachers, um, and that's the balance. And when I hear from Mike Reddick and he says, there's no school, uh, schools don't offer 10 classes. So yes, our kids have learned to take advantage of that, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right culture. So it's a little bit of a culture shift for us and a, and, and a mindset that we have to get around. And there's going to be some things that we currently see. You know, at times kids may have to make a little bit more choice than they currently are making um, on how to fit things together. Mm -hmm. But it seems like, um, I, I just hope that it seems like we can think through yeah. where the conference is. My guess is five years out, we probably got it down. But the next couple of years, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want kids to lose out, like over the four years, maybe yep. they'd be able to have that opportunity. I think it's a really fair point, Robin. And you know, I don't want to sit here and make promises, but what I can do is talk to you about process. So I can talk to you about the process that we've gone through so far and how thoughtful it is. The number of school visits and school interviews and meeting with kids and meeting with parents and a 19-person scheduling committee. Um, we don't go in and take any of this for granted and lightly. And likewise, whatever we, we decide is the right um, structure to, to implement, we want to make sure we're piloting it, testing it behind the scenes. Um, there's going to be snafus. There's going to be some hurdles along the way. We're going to do something and we're going to realize mm, that didn't fit right and you know, our ability to make corrective action is going to be important also. So let's shift. Block scheduling. Same, this is a little easier to see. Again, unit lunch, 11.13 to 11.55. Same uh, 40, uh, well, same 42 minute lunch period. And now, period nine, end of the day, same time, 2.38 to 3.20. That leaves us with eight other periods of instruction. Think of them as odd and even, i.e., from 9.10 to 9.50. It's still running every day. And now what we have is we have odd periods, period one, period three, period five, period seven on A day, period two, period four, period six, period eight on B day. and. Um, Classes meet for 77 minutes each period. So kids, it was interesting. We didn't think the students would love this schedule. Students love this, the idea of this schedule, but they're really scared about this schedule. <laughs> Can you imagine? Why do, do you know why they love it? Bingo. You just hit the number one reason. They're like, I only have to go home and think about four classes every night? Four classes? Like, they were like, that's, like, that's manageable. I can do that. Um, and why do you think it scares them to no end? The length of the period. Yeah, so the length itself doesn't scare them. It's the length if the experience is going to be the same experience that they have in any other class. So we know that if we shift to a model like this, the support for teachers to be able to teach into this model is going to be really important. And we visited and spoke to a number of schools. So right here down the road, Hastings High School, uh, I mean, in Hastings, their high school has a schedule very similar to this. They do a block schedule. I know I was speaking with Michael last night, and she So you know that's great. I'm sorry I haven't done that in both of these models. So our A B classes will fit into any of these models. It's a little bit of technicality. In this case, what we've decided, because we don't want phys ed to meet once every four days, that we 
feels off to us. So we would take our periods and actually run half versions of them. So phys ed would meet for 38 minutes every other day um, instead of 42 minutes. So it's slightly shorter, um, but they currently run every other day. So, um, and then likewise, if it's going up, let's say it's going up against science lab, science lab would also be the other half of that period. So all of our AP day classes would fit into this. Similarly, in the drop schedule, um, they would be a full one of these, and it would take two cycles. So we really would be thinking of eight day cycles. So we take two of these to get through it. So if every class meets three out of four days, then that also means that every class meets six out of eight days. People with me? Yeah. Right, with the ratios? Yeah. And if classes meet half time, then they would meet three out of every eight days, like an AB day class, or science lab or phys ed. So it fits mathematically. And we've worked to figure out how each of these places. And I will tell you that in all of these, like some of the considerations where we have shared staff, how it meets with the middle school. So we may have to give slight variations of these, but I want to make sure you understand the core aspects of these schedules and, and, and what we're looking to accomplish. So the so if I have a half year class, then I have 77 minutes every other day, period one for the first half of the year, and then the second half of the year. But it's, 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 it's six in one hand and half a dozen in the other. By the midpoint of the half year, I'm, it's still the same number of, it's still the same. Yeah, yeah, You got it. It's, technically it's a little, this gets you a little more than the drop. So again, currently our class is 42 minutes, so it's technically 84 minutes. Here it's 77, so it feels like we're losing seven minutes. But again, it's only one transition. Um, teachers only have to set up their classes uh, half the amount of time. Kids are going through half the transitions. We're actually picking up time because kids aren't changing between three minutes between every one of their classes and times a day. So we're actually maximizing the efficiency of our schedule by doing something like this. Is there a question? I think I see the ID on every one of these different yep. models. Is there pretty much a consensus that that's so we've gone back and forth, and there's certainly some, some in the faculty, some amongst the students that said, is it really needed every single day? And given all the things that we've talked about that we value that, and all the reasons that we have to fit this in, um, I, I really believe in it, and I think it's important. I mean, the gain that we would have to run it, let's say, three out of every four days or every other day is a little bit extra minutes in our classes, but what we would lose is at the heart of all the reasons why we're doing it in the first place. So, you know, again, this is going to be, this is simple because I gave it through the lens of four teachers. But I want every teacher to have office hours. I want every department to be able to have professional learning time. That's going to be really comprehensive. This is probably going to play out on an eight-day cycle. Um, and there's going to be tons of opportunities. So, um, Really, uh, at the end of the day, um, people who really see the vision and the value of this um, have all come forward and say making it every day makes the most sense. I think this is where um, schedule will allow spaces for people to work together. Yeah. Because right now, it's just like us. Yes. So most definitely. Less. Correct. <laughs> most definitely. And what we're going to try to do is be strategic. So, um, you know, I don't have ninth graders that are in Model UN. So I could schedule Model UN, even though it's not like that here, on the same day when I have peer leadership, possibly, although my peer leaders themselves might be in there. So, but that's kind of, you know, we can start to pair and, and see where things play out. And, same thing with two lunch periods. So the same concept. Lunch starts at 11.13. And the next period st uh, starts at 11.58, goes to 1.15. So I can either have lunch at the beginning of this time period or at the back end 
So we have the A and the B versions of it. So I know it looks messy, but I want to make sure I'm explaining it conceptually. Tanya? Um, I know in the previous meeting, the question came up is how do teachers feel about adjusting yep. their teaching styles, methods, yep. to a 77 minute yep. period? Because that's not only a big adjustment yeah. for students, but a big adjustment for teachers, too. Mm -hmm. Because nobody, I don't imagine, teachers are generally not going to want to stand up there for 77 minutes, nor do students want to. No, work. like I've been doing tonight so and preaching to you the whole time. Right. So, you know, here's what I'm going to tell you. There are many teachers that say block scheduling sounds great, and there are some teachers that say, I don't want to go near block scheduling, and there are some teachers that say, I really like the job, and there are some teachers that say, I don't want to go anywhere near the job schedule. I don't see how that's going to work. I have some teachers that say, it's fine the way it is. Just tell kids they have to take lunch and everything goes away. A, I don't believe that that's at the root of where we're at. And by the way, this isn't teachers against anyone, but you know that's one perspective. And you know, uh, I'll just put it out there as reality. Uh, you know, I've been in Irvington. This is my fifth year. I could just come out tomorrow and say, so we've created a new policy. Every kid has to have lunch. But whenever I'm going to run lunch at the same time, exactly minute by minute, when a kid could take a class afterwards, I could tell you that my experience in Irvington is I will not be able to enforce that over time and mandate it for all. And as soon as I allow one student to take a class during lunch, I need to be fair and allow all. And now I'm creating that standard again. So I am a strong believer that we need dedicated lunch time. So um, one of these models I'm hoping is the right one for us. Um, but Tanya, I'll expand on the answer. I don't think it's just the teachers, to be honest, but with a lot of students. Some students say, you got to do block. And by the way, it's not always the students I thought. Sometimes it's some of our highest performing students. Sometimes it's struggling and really dedicated students. And they <coughs> see themselves in that model. This is the right model. Um, but again, the most consistent thing I hear kids saying is there can be real value in block, but we know that over time teachers um, would need support. And, how, and by the way, the teachers said the same thing. We're going to need professional development to train us how to run our classes in a 77-minute model. Um, there's pros and cons. There's pros and cons to both. You know, I can't tell you that we, uh, you know, just when I thought that we as a school were leaning towards drop, all of a sudden I started to hear a lot of people saying, I think block can work. And, you know, since the last parent presentation, I received emails from passionate parents that spoke to their kids and said, you can't go block. And others that say, you better go block. And it's like, you know, I'm like, oh. So I'm going to make some people really happy, and I'm going to make some people really upset. But what we're going to do is we're going to be really thoughtful about having a schedule that can work for everyone, and then supporting kids, parents, and teachers to make sure that whatever we pick, um, we're going to grow into in a really effective way. So I believe that there is a value in IE for every single child. So, you know, I, and, and I apologize, I know there's a lot of information tonight. So while teachers would have office hours, while teachers would have professional department meetings, teachers will also have plenty of days where they're free, free to meet with colleagues around their own planning time but also free to decide that they want to create more time with kids, either to support them in what's going on in class, or maybe because a bunch of kids came forward and said, you know, we want to explore something new that we don't have here in Irvington, not for credit, just because we want to learn it. And you're a teacher that could help us do that. Can we sit in your room or, you know, you want to help? And maybe a teacher says, I want to learn that too. So I think that the culture of learning beyond our grade books and beyond our classes has the potential of skyrocketing. And we've seen this in other schools. I visited a school in Pennsylvania where uh, there was a rock band that met during their IE period uh, uh, every such and such days. And there were teachers that played in it and kids that played in it. They were playing rock music together and they were playing a bunch of cool stuff. So um, 
So there are opportunities that exist, and I don't think it's only for freshmen or seniors. I think all students can benefit from it. And I don't know if I said it, but the goal is to implement a new master schedule to start next school year. Totally. You know, and it fits in with another conversation that we've been having for those of you that had students that graduated last year. We're trying to start to evolve in, in the internship experience. And one of the things that the, the, the site committee has been talking about is that um, not only the purity of the internship could be enhanced, but also the learning that we know our students need as we're getting ready to send them off to college. So I think it's exactly what you're talking about. You know, some of our students don't know how to think about their personal finances, and the next thing you know, we're giving them credit cards and bank accounts, and we're sending them off to college. Or uh, they need some real lessons around, um, uh, you know, the, the, the social scene outside of Irvington and some of uh, the dangers and the issues and, 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 and ha how to be prepared for that. Or what does it mean to put together a resume and to go on an interview? So we may be able to work into IE some of those um, experiences um, for seniors. I would imagine that in some cases, some of our college visits could be worked into um, the IE period. Not all of them, um, but some of them could. Uh, I know you mentioned about the music tour, mm -hmm. but as I Well, if we pulled them out for 77 minutes, it would. But you know, maybe if I pulled them out for 38 minutes of 77, they, they wouldn't. So we haven't gotten to that point. I think it's a really good point that you're bringing up. And it's a really important one that we're going to need to settle on before we finalize anything. If there's a way for me to maximize it, listen, quite frankly, we already have students that are doing some of their music pull out during lunch. So while I want kids to have lunch in their schedule, if occasionally um, they were doing music or if occasionally they were doing it during IE, and you know, now I got to make sure what a teacher's day looks like and can it fit in, um, there may be some flex for us to anticipate that. Um, but that's a layer that we certainly have to, to work through and, and try to, ideally, I'm never pulling kids out of any class. Right now, we're pulling a lot of kids out of a lot of classes. So, you know, if I can get rid of most of it, that's a really good thing. If I can eventually get rid of all of it, that's a really great thing. I think it's a number of things. I, it's not just about lunch. I think it's competition and it's the pressure. It's the pressure of college. It's the pressure of what it feels like to be successful. I think social media has really changed the experiences that our teenagers go through. I think it's brought in their anticipation of competition. I think it's brought in their social circles. Um, there could be some really great aspects of it, but you know, um, the lifestyles that our, our teens go through now versus when we grew up is um, two very different worlds. Um, I have a lot of um, compassion and empathy for what they go through and the challenges and the difficulties that they face. And some do a great job and navigate it just fine. Um, our job as parents and as educators um, is even uh, more difficult than it was to be able to support our teens through that. Um, some of it could be scientific aspects of technology and what it means to stare at a screen all the time. Um, I know that teenagers typically stay up real late, but I think in this world of technology, it's, it's, it's even more so. Um, so, you know, brain re research talks about uh, the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that controls uh, instinct and instinctual behaviors and um, fight and flight syndrome and taking risks. And taking risks can be a really good thing in life. If we don't take risks, then you know what? We'd all be sitting in the dark right now and we wouldn't advance as, as, as a culture. So we want our teenagers to take risks. And What's unique is that um, the amygdala is undersized during the teenage years. So we are wired 
and uh, someone made us so that we would take more risks as teenagers than we do at any other age of our life. Um, but you know, as culture and 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 um, and society evolves, and those risks come with more dangers that surround one another, um, then uh, the difficulties and uh, the risks that we take can have really negative impacts. And you know, we all know. And I, I don't want to turn this into a bummer, but you know. Um, the amount of drug use and you know the drugs that teenagers have access to today versus drugs that teenagers had access to when I was in high school. Um, you know we could talk about THC elevations in marijuana. Um, you know when I was growing up, uh, the research shows that marijuana, and I'm, I'm probably not going to be right on this, but I'll give you a comparative nature. Probably was like five percent THC, and nowadays it's like fifteen to twenty percent THC. But then. Um, there's ways that students can, can cook marijuana and, and, and manipulate it so that they can get just the, the oils and the gels that's 70 percent THC. Um, you know, we've seen uh, opioids and, and exposure to heroin and fentanyl is all over the place. So when you are feeling stressed, and this isn't just for teens, this is for any age group, and we go through it as adults, you want to be able to find uh, de-stressors. And it would be great if everyone de-stressed by eating healthy and exercising and finding a, a great book to jump themselves into. Um, but when you put social factors involved, um, you know, the desire to unwind with, with, with a drink or unwind uh, with, with, with drug use um, is there and it's front and center and it becomes really risky and you know the risk of wanting to drive fast and take you know all these things exist and some of it's great we, we need to let our teenagers take risks and, and 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 hope and pray every single day that their risks don't turn into tragedies and we also want to be smart about how to minimize it but i can tell you that the stress that our teenagers are going through um, is uh, more pronounced than i've ever seen before so I hope I'm answering the question, and I hope I'm also not scaring the bejesus out of everybody. What other questions exist? Um, since it looks like <coughs> it was just you know, with two other classes in one schedule, and you're looking at scheduling overall from the ground up, would you also consider looking at, say, even like prerequisites, like what's the sequence for a subject? So for example, people have to take studio art, even if ultimately all they really want to take is photography. Mm -hmm. So maybe studio art, you know, you can't fit studio art into your, into your schedule, but maybe you don't have to take that right. studio. I think it raises a couple of different questions. Um, I'm not so sure. You know, I think there are reasons why there's prerequisites, and I think we always need to look at them. So I don't know that one automatically influences the other. But I can tell you that the potential of having one less period in our day is um, raising real concerns for um, the teachers in our predominantly elective programs. Um, and they're worried that it's going to undermine their programs. And when I told you that we only have 28 students in our school last year that were taking a full 10 classes, um, the majority of those 28 kids were freshmen and sophomores. So we do know that we have more requirements in those age levels than in the other grades. And I think there's something that we need to be able to look at there because we don't want to kill our programs by any stretch. And we want, you know, when I got, when I came to Irvington, one of the things that I noticed was that um, there weren't a lot of multi-year programs. Certainly we know about our Latin and our classics program, but otherwise there was a lot of a class here and a class there that sounded great. And one of the things that I've tried to uh, put in, in place here is developing two, three, four year programs so that students can also specialize and really grow and expand their learning. And if we minimize the potential for students to explore that over multiple years, then I think we're taking away from something that's really important. It goes to that choice and it goes to our curriculum. So we may need to look at whether or not we are more creative about how we provide students access to our classes. Might we do a better job of looking at our um, half credit class options or things like that as ways to either get kids to pass through prerequisites or make sure that they're exposed to curriculum each and every year to develop and grow over time. So it's a long-winded way. I hope I answered your question. Mm -hmm. So, would one of the 
Um, I think, and, and, and I'm going to answer this from gut. I'm not going to answer this from technical. I'm the person who's put together the master schedule for the high school for the last three years now. And my gut says that scheduling in a block schedule, it would be easier. There's less moving parts. It's easier to see it lay out. That being said, you know, every time you want to add a class, I got to take something out because if we use the same amount of teachers, so if anyone has any influence over budget, I'll take more teachers. But <laughs> if we have the same number of, of, of teachers, then I have a set number of teaching periods. If I want to add something, then something's coming away. And that can happen because I've realized that something's outdated, we don't need it anymore, or I realize that we're putting, uh, we're making really small class sizes and we can truncate it, maybe slightly increase in one place to create an opportunity somewhere else. So ultimately, once we create the manpower to have a class, uh, I think ultimately it can fit into either schedule. Questions? Yes. So, you know, th there was some logic um, where our lunch tends to fall um, and trying to find an ideal time. If we took IE out of the morning sessions, we find that lunch tends to then fall even earlier when we want to have a balance to our day. So if we're doing a drop schedule and we want to have um, three periods in the morning and three in the afternoon. We want lunch to be balanced. If we take IE and put it in the afternoon, then lunch just became 40 minutes earlier. And we're now looking in the 10 o'clock hour. So some of it is just trying to strategically, some of it is also campus-based and trying to figure out. Um, my fear is the later in the day that you put IE, uh, the, the more that you increase the likelihood that kids may have a free period after it, and then they bolt and they don't take advantage of what IE is all about as well. So it's a couple of, a couple of thoughts that went into that. It was just for me thinking that, you know, what they tend to do in the morning. Yeah. Well, you know, and something that didn't come up tonight, and I know some parents were really hoping and some kids were really hoping that when we talked about changing our master schedule, the first starting point was going to be pushing the start of the school day off. And, um, you, know, you know, right now that's, that's not what we're talking about. You know, I would love to take our entire schedule and figure out a way to just elevate it forward in the day, but then we really talk about the, our, our athletics and, and how it infringes on that. So um, we haven't considered that. Um, but then knowing that, I can also say that mornings for our teenagers is actually typically not when their brain is freshest. So if we can bring them in and then provide an opportunity for some activity and sort of wake them up, um, then uh, it you know, potentially could really work to support the day. Um, there's a neighboring Westchester district that actually starts their day with an IE period. Um, fatal flaw. I, I, I don't think it's a good decision because what they found were kids aren't coming at all. Kids aren't coming at all. Um, you know, we're not necessarily looking to mandate that seniors can't go off campus. Uh, you know, it's always the balance between rite of passage and culture. That doesn't mean I'm not willing to implement changes. I, I would imagine I've probably implemented plenty already. Um, but I can also tell you that um, this may limit some of their chances as to how long they can have off campus also. Some of the seniors are a little worried about this, these models. <laughs> and only 40 minutes. And how am I getting back fast enough? And if everyone's going at the same time, and will I get a spot when I come back? <laughs> so um, I think there'll be some cultural pieces that we'll see amongst our, our seniors that play out from this. I'm just curious what the kids had to say about the drop schedule. I mean, I think it looks great not having the same class every yeah, day. And the, 
They love it, and <laughs> teachers. So the, the rotational aspect of it, kids and teachers love it. And no problems like getting used to it and like you know, where they need to be. Parents have raised that question more than anyone else, <laughs> and teachers that don't <laughs> like. So, so here's a few yeah. things. There are teachers that don't like the model that that'll be the first thing they say. It's going to be confusing. Nobody's going to be able to follow it. Here's what I, I, I told you I started my career and spent 13 years in a school that every day had a different schedule. And they were an hour period, sometimes it was 62 minutes, three times a week, and every day was a different schedule. And you know who had the, the least issues with the schedule? Kids. Kids adapt, they're fine. It may take, you know, you, we saw a school that implemented a rotation and what they do is they have a, a video tutorial for kids to follow and um, there's sort of like a week of uh, guiding kids through that process. They adapt easy. We as adults, we're the ones that struggle with it. So, um, but that whole idea of not always having the same period at the same time so far, the benefits. But I will tell you that logistically on a shared campus with some shared teachers, um, it does create some hurdles. So it can be done, but we may have to modify it a little bit. Um, uh, so there's pros and cons to either model. That's, that's the tough part. There are days I wake up and I'm like, I want this model. And then there are days that I wake up and I'm like, no, 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 I want this model. Um, I just want the right model for our kids. Either one, I think, could be the right model, um, but we're going to really keep digging in. I really believe the right model is, um, is a model with an IE period, a model where every kid is taking lunch, and a model where, over time, kids and teachers are going to explore um, a, a really great way to elevate teaching and learning here at Arlington High School. So I believe it can happen in either or. So for me, it's not so much what I want. I want to keep reading, uh, ultimately, kids and, 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 um, um, and teachers to find out where uh, we're going to have the most global commitment to say, this model is going to work for us. Let's do it, and let's take this step, and let's grow and learn and make it even better each year. Um, and that's why I'm doing this. I want to hear from parents, but what I really want you to do is I want you to go talk to your kids. I want you to have honest conversations. It's not just asking them which model do you like and then popping me an email and saying it. Um, I want you to ask them why. What's good about this model? What's going to work? What, what, you know, what are the pros and cons? None of, there's no such thing as the perfect model. If there was a perfect model, then every school in the country would be using it. So it, it, it's, we have to weigh it out. So speak to your children. Speak to your kids. And uh, if you feel like you're getting some really rich and, and important feedback, send me an email. Send me an email. If you have more questions, send me an email. We're videotaping. It's going to go up on the website. Um, I'm hoping that people will watch it, although I would imagine that being here for now almost two hours might have been easier than just sitting at home and watching the video. Um, hopefully, I've entertained you. But more importantly, hopefully, I've informed you. And that's really what I want to make sure that we're doing. Um, so if more questions come up, please reach out. Um, we don't want to create unnecessary urgency, like you only have four more days to give input. Um, but you know, for the reasons that I've spelled out tonight, um, if we don't you know, try to make a decision soon, then I worry that we won't have all the good planning time necessary to implement for next year. So I, I'm a pleaser. I would love to please everyone. But I know I can't do that. Um, but I can get good information. And we can use that and meet with our scheduling committee to move forward. So I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, I appreciate it. And like I said, if you have input um, information, uh, or questions uh, to Matt, to myself, just send us an email. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.